So I believe that all intelligence is ultimately collective intelligence. And this insight really builds on a substantial body of work by scientists who have been showing that no matter at what scale, we have entities that interact to satisfy some macroscopic properties. So at the one extreme, we have cells and organisms that organize themselves to maintain system-wide equilibria throughout environmental disruptions. And on the other extreme, we have groups of organisms that reorganize themselves to provide survival-critical mechanisms. And one of the reasons why collective intelligence has captured our imagination for so long is because it's shown to be adaptive, efficient, and resilient. So it turns out that these qualities, they really matter as we design ever more complex engineered systems, as we tackle urbanization and dense living and even environmental change. And we're th I'm talking about you know, vehicles interacting with other vehicles, and we're forming groups of robots to solve hard tasks. And so we're already really seeing how robotics is becoming pervasive and distributed and connected. But we're not really at really large-scale cooperative systems. And we're not really benefiting from wide-scale collective intelligence. So what is it that we need to do in order to get there? And what might the benefits be are we able to achieve this? So we designed a very simple experiment to find out. So a couple years back, when I joined the University of Cambridge, we decided to build a miniature highway model in my lab with a couple of students. And what we did is we basically took an off-the-shelf toy robot, and we took it apart, turned it inside out, and we equipped, with, we, we equipped it with compute and communication in order to allow the robots to drive autonomously, but also to communicate with one another so that they could potentially cooperate. And we did all of this with the aim of trying to find out what cooperative schemes could provide us with. And so we designed two experiments. So the first experiment, we started with a model which I'm calling my egocentric driver behavior, where cars are not cooperating. And we designed a bottleneck type scenario where we create this blockage where we stop one vehicle on the inner lane and we watch what happens. And so because these vehicles are not cooperating in any way, they're driving you centrically, the cars on the inner lane, they start building up traffic because there's no way that they can negotiate a safe merge onto the outer lane. So this is what happens in non-cooperative driving. This is a phenomenon that you'll be very familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> so we started thinking, what can we do if we can leverage cooperation? So what we did is we said, OK, we're going to have the vehicles talk to each other. And they're going to be sharing their incentives. They're going to be telling each other what it is that they're going to do. And they're going to be thinking about, well, how can we maneuver so that it's good for everybody? And the key thing here is that the cars are going to be talking to each other locally. So they're going to be sharing information with each other in a local neighborhood, right? And so we create the same trigger scenario. So we block a car on the inner lane. And the only difference is that the cars are now talking to each other. And what happens, it's ever so subtle, but the cars on the inner lane are able to safely merge onto the outer lane because the cars on the outer lane are just ever so slightly slowing down, making that very little bit of space for them to move in. And so it turns out that in that scenario, in this tiny little mini, miniature you know, highway, we already gain 35% um, improvement on throughput. So, if cooperative systems are so beneficial to us, then why don't we integrate them in all our engineered system, into all of our robotic systems? What is holding us back? Well, it turns out that these kinds of problems are actually computationally really, really hard. So, what I'm showing you here in this schema is um, a plot that shows us how hard it is for a computer to provide us with a solution to the pathfinding problem. So on the vertical axis, we have solution quality, so optimality. And on the horizontal axis, I'm showing you how quickly these computers can actually solve these problems for problems at scale. Okay. And what you can see here is that it seems that we're hitting a hard trade-off. So 
with current solvers, it's currently not possible to provide with optimal solutions and at the same time provide them quickly for larger systems. But what we want to do is we actually want to go there, right? We want quick solvers and for systems at scale. So how can we do this? Well, we took a closer look at these solutions that provide us um, with these um, current um, techniques, right? And it turns out that all of the current solvers lean on some component that is centralized, either centralized compute or centralized control. And this really complexifies the problem. So what if we were to enable the agents to talk to each other, to cooperate, and leverage some form or another of collective intelligence to go about solving these pathfinding problems, which would otherwise be so difficult to compute? So we thought about how we would do this. And it turns out that designing systems where robots communicate with one another through hand-designed communication rules is really hard. And you have to redesign the rules for every new application you're targeting. And so we thought about, well, hey, we're going to use machine learning to try and teach these agents how to cooperate, how to communicate with one another so that they can solve these tasks elegantly and across a wide range of applications. And so we began by modeling how one robot's observation influences the decisions of another robot. And we then made this interaction explicit by using that model to generate the messages for us that the robots are sending each other, essentially teaching the robots to communicate, to cooperate. And what's really nice about this model is that it scales to an arbitrary number of robots. So we can now use this model, and what it tells us, it, it allows you to understand how to process incoming information from an arbitrary number of, of incoming um, messages from an arbitrary number of, of neighboring robots. And so this robot I here is now running this neural network, it's processing these incoming messages, and it now <coughs> knows how to base its decision based on, on what this neural network is telling it to do. So let's look at an example. So I mentioned the multi-agent pathfinding problem before. And it turns out this, this multi-agent pathfinding problem is one of the hardest problems um, in multi-agent research. What this problem consists of is basically every robot in the system starts at a given um, starting position, has to reach um, a designated position, and it has to do this with the, the quickest possible path. Um, and it has to do this whilst all the other robots, hundreds of other robots around it, are doing the same thing at the same time. Okay? So conventional solvers typically take several minutes to compute a solution to optimality for systems of even moderate scale. And as we increase the size of these systems, this issue exacerbates. So it can take several, several minutes to do this. And what's worse, any time we change anything in these environments, so we can move an obstacle or change the layout of the environment, we have to recompute the solution from scratch. So clearly, this is not a very elegant solution, and it's not very efficient. And it's clearly also not robust. So we tackled this problem with our solution, which is teaching the robots to learn, to communicate, to cooperate in this multi-agent navigation problem. And so instead of leveraging these centralized components, we now have the robots interacting with each other in a purely local manner because they've learned to communicate the relevant information that allows them to process incoming information and decide what the best next step is for them to execute, the best next direction to take, leading them on the, hopefully, near optimal path to their destination. And so what's nice about this is that the robots or agents are now using their own brains, their own local computational um, resources to compute these solutions. And hence, we can provide these solutions at a fraction of the cost of what these um, conventional centralized solvers would otherwise be doing. So this is really nice, but I'm showing you point robots here. And so we started thinking about, OK, how do we take these solutions and deploy them and transfer them into the real world? What is the challenge of doing this? So the problem is, as we have robots learning in the real world, inevitably, they start colliding and crashing and things break. And I run a research lab, so that's not cool. So the thing is that these collisions or near collisions um, actually provide a really important learning signal to the robots. And so we need to think about how to actually facilitate these experiences in a safe manner. 
And so what we came up with is a mixed reality um, scheme where we have a robot learning in the real world, but all the dangerous bits are happening in virtual reality. So what we do is we pre-train a policy in simulation, which provides the robot with a couple of um, basic capabilities that teach it how to move in a miniature um, workspace. And then we deploy that premature policy into the real world and let the robot continue learning a little bit whilst it's interacting with virtual counterpart robots. So in the beginning, the behavior is very erratic, the robot is you know, moving, um, changing lanes without really having to, and it's moving through our virtual obstacles, and it's kind of learning how to deal with these um, negative rewards that it's experiencing here. All the while, everything is happening very safely. But already after a couple hours of training in this mixed reality setup, the real vehicle learns how to move more cautiously and stops changing lanes unnecessarily. And it also has stopped crashing into other obstacles and vehicles. And so this is really nice because we now have a scheme of how to transfer our policies from simulation um, to the real world on the way to really real world applications. So in my talk thus far, we've been talking about the autonomous mobility problem in isolation. But it turns out that in order to do this, we have to deploy a whole bunch of sophisticated sensors, intelligence and compute on the vehicles so that they can operate in a standalone manner and face any po possible corner scenario they might encounter in the real world. And I actually think we're setting ourselves up with a really hard task. So perhaps why not literally allow the robots to see around corners? Why don't we think about distributing the intelligence? And by doing this, we would potentially allow the robots to see around corners. We would potentially allow the robots to predict approaching traffic. And we would potentially allow them to behave much more robustly because they have foresight. And what's nice about this all is that the sophisticated sensors and the cost of deploying them is now shared by all the vehicles in the mobility system because the sensing and intelligence also becomes part of the infrastructure. So let's look at how we went about this, this vision, um, uh, how, how we can think about making this a reality. So we designed this setup where we're thinking about how to enable a robot to see what it can see in a task where it's trying to navigate to a target which is initially out of its line of sight. So this robot here that I'm showing you has to navigate to this green box which is its target and it can't see it at the outset. So what it has to do is it has to cooperate with a network of visual sensors that are distributed in this cluttered environment and these visual sensors are gonna help it find its way to this target that is out of sight. And we do this, again, by teaching the visual sensor network to learn how to disseminate relevant information to the robot as it navigates in the scenario. And so, as you can see here, um, this setup is extremely robust to changes in the environment, and you can even pick up the sensors and move the sensor nodes around, so they're completely positioning-free and calibration-free because everything is computed based on visual encodings. And you can see how the robot is always able to find the green target, no matter where it's located. And even if there is no visual sensor at the beginning um, within the field, receptive field of the target, as soon as you move a visual sensor into the visual receptive field of the target, the robot immediately receives that information and is able to reach it. So this is truly distributed intelligence. It has been said by few that the true superpower of humanity is that we can collaborate at large scale. And we do this by transcending religion, international borders, language. And we're really able to leverage this to share our collective intelligence. But we're not quite there yet with our engineered systems. But I do believe that we can get there. We can get to collectively intelligent systems by integrating these large-scale cooperative solutions into our engineered systems. And I do believe that this really does have extraordinary potential. There are, of course, risks that we have to be very careful about. But for me, the downsides are smaller than the upsides. And I hope that with this talk, I've been able to excite you about the things that we can do, thanks to the confluence of AI, communications, and mobile computing. And I remain incredibly excited and optimistic about our opportunities for which I think the sky is the limit.
Thank you very much for your attention. Come on back. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for starting us off today uh, and a fascinating presentation. So um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is, I mean, uh, there are things like, uh, there's a company uh, in the north of this region uh, called Tharsis that is well known for working with Ocado and other sort of uh, uh, large retailers yeah. for these warehouse robots, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you've seen many, many times. Is that an early example of the kind of coordination, co communication thing that you're discussing, obviously in a very different scale? Yeah, so um, it turns out that um, systems like that often leverage a substantial centralized component because mm. they can afford to. Um, the kinds of problems they solve um, kind of lean on other components that allow them to structure the problem in such a way that they can actually compute these very sure. quickly. And if you're familiar with the o Ocado kind of warehouse um, layout, it's very structured. So the robots are moving on rails, and there's relatively little that can actually happen. And you certainly never have like a reconfiguration of the environment. So yeah. this issue of having to recompute solutions and doing it quickly is, is much, much smaller in those kind of really structured environments. Right. So Okay, uh, so they effectively engineer out the conflict and the problems uh, and, yeah. and thing from the from the start. Yeah. So. so, so this idea of actually designing an environment that suits your application is powerful, and they they certainly did that um, to great effect. Okay, cool. So, uh, with the, with a if you will more free form environment, which mm -hmm. is obviously what you're talking about, mm -hmm. um, I, I guess is there a likely first area we we might see mm -hmm. these this become more apparent? So we've been transitioning from very, very structured to less structured to the real wild um, kind of um, real life type scenarios. And I think um, the next kind of stage is, for example, agricultural robotics, which is, which is a little bit less structured than a warehouse, but it's still somewhat structured. So you're kind of moving up and down a straight line. Um, so you're relaxing some of the difficulties, but not all of them. Um, and then kind of highway traffic is easier than city traffic, for example. Right. So moving slowly from, from you know, very structured to a little bit less structured to, to the absolutely unstructured. Okay, cool. <laughs> and then, I, I mean, one of the things that we talked about um, and is this idea, so as I, meant, as I mentioned in the beginning, mm -hmm. when I first heard of your work, I was just thinking better self-driving cars and obviously your, uh, the implications of your work stretch a lot further than that. Is, is, it, is it basically an inevitability mm -hmm. that you know, at some point, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining, say, 50 to 100 years, where people just think, why, why would I learn how to draw, why, mm -hmm. why, why would, you know? So, I mean, is the mm -hmm. ultimate vision that people just, because, I mean, I think I yeah. read something like 6,300 people spend, in the UK, yeah. people spend, in their working life, 6,300 hours of driving in their mm -hmm. life, in their professional lifetime, basically driving to and from work or work-related trips, mm -hmm. right? Which it's kind of an insane amount of time to just sit there behind a wheel, yeah. like, you mm -hmm. know. And hopefully you're not doing anything else but driving, <laughs> but obviously uh, <laughs> some, some folks yeah. have been rumored to. There's a lot of to... time we can save, and um, it's also argued that assistive driving or even fully autonomous driving is ultimately safer or will be safer. Yeah. Uh, there are people who say that driving is 100% a, a computable problem, so it'll happen at some point um, that we have computers <laughs> taking this over. Yeah. Uh, I think the road towards that kind of status is quite long still. Okay. Um, and my personal opinion is I think we cannot do it without leveraging infrastructure and more intelligent infrastructure and sensing. Right. Um, I think we do need to do that because there are a lot of corner cases that you have and you know sticky urban scenarios that are very difficult to tackle if your sensing is only on board. Mm. Um, but you know, personally, I think uh, I, I commute on my bike, which is fantastic. I love that. But if I'd have to commute by car, I don't think I'd really enjoy that because I prefer yeah. making better well, use of it. in Cambridge, so yeah. <laughs> notoriously. Bill would tell us a notoriously <laughs> bad place to drive at rush yeah, hour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, No, I, I actually hope that we will have more um, technology for, for mobility overall. I think it'll... There are, there are only benefits in it um, okay. in terms of time saving and safety and, and so on and so forth. How we will get there, I think, is still um, an open question. Interesting. Yeah. Amanda, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Herb. Cheers. Thank you.